Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today's video I want to talk about abnormal physical phenomena observed when the Sun, Moon and Earth are aligned. And this is part of a series of videos which are relating to the proposal to translate Alexander Parkhamov's book, which is here, Space, Earth, Human, New Concepts in Science, or something similar to that, uh, by Alexander Parkhamov. And it's talking about, uh, in one sense, a gravitational lensing of relic neutrinos. And what I want to do is also talk about how the observations in this work uh, may relate to Alexander Parkhamov's work, and also how these observations relate to some of the uh, low energy nuclear reactions work, some work by the US military, and also work that we've uh, shown you over the last couple of years. Some of it will be hypothesis, but uh, I'd like to present uh, these hypotheses and see uh, if they resonate with you. So this particular article was given to me by a chap called Peter in response to one of the previous videos in this series. And it's an article from a, a journal or a magazine called 21st Century Science and Technology. And this is the fall 1999 edition. So I'm going to take you back to the start of the article. If I can, there we go. And essentially, uh, this is by one Professor Xu Wenzhu from the Department of Physics, Hua Zhong University of Science and Technology in China. And uh, the subtext here is contrary to accepted theories of gravitation, the three body alignment occurring at solar and lunar eclipse produce a measurable abnormal effect on force and time measurements. So these kind of things are uh, discussed in here um, uh, with Alexander Parkmo's experiments. This is some work that was conducted in China and the work uh, it's saying here, the editor is saying that Professor Zhu contacted 21st Century shortly after the publication of the work of Morris Elias in the spring 1998 issue. So we talked about uh, uh, Morris Elias in the previous uh, video. He was uh, uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner uh, and did studies on various type of pendulum uh, to uh, establish things going on uh, in terms of cycles. Uh, that may be related to gravity or some other type of force or field going on. Uh, Mickelson Morley Miller, this is the title of the um, article in the 1998 issue, spring 1998 issue, the cover-up. Uh, informing us of the his independent researchers in verifying the conclusions of Elias that the theory of gravitation should be developed. This article is his summary of several reports, both published and unpublished, covering more than one decade of experimental work. So, going into the meat of the article. During the period when three bodies, the Sun, the Moon and the Earth, are in an approximately straight line, there appear some inexplicable anomalies of physical character. These include an unusual force of horizontal oscillation, Strange changes in the pattern of grain sequence in crystals, changes in wavelength of emission spectra, and changes in the rate of speed of atomic clocks. Since 1987, my collaborators have been and I have been conducting numerous observations and analyses of these strange phenomena. So, he then says, Beginning in the 1950s, scientists noticed some inexplicable mechanical phenomena which occur on the Earth when Sun, the Moon and the Earth line up approximately along a straight line. These are generally called gravitational anomalies. First, Morris Elias discovered the azimuth change of a paraconical <laughs> modified Foucault pendulum during a solar eclipse. Uh, and so, essentially, uh, azimuth is essentially saying that, you know, if it, it, it's moving around like this, it will move around uh, differently. Uh, and there's sort of be a slight change in angle uh, during the uh, eclipse uh, or uh, alignments of the Earth, Moon and Sun. Then, also, during solar eclipse, Lu, Lui Quan Wang 
found an unusual inclination of a clinometer, an instrument that measures angles of elevation or inclination, as if a horizontal force of 10 to 20 micrograms was applied to the instrument. Thereafter, T. Kusela found an uh, abnormal inclination from the plane of a torsion pendulum during a solar eclipse. E.J. Saxel discovered that a relative change of magnitude 10 to the minus 4 in partial cycle of torsion pendulum uh, occurred during a solar eclipse. Yet, other, yet others have found that the change for the entire cycle was zero. The following is a summary of some of the research of these very exciting physical phenomena that I and my colleagues carried out in China. So the first of these uh, sort of family of anomalies that they investigated uh, was abnormal horizontal force detected during eclipse. So he has this apparatus, it's well described, you've got a weight, a sheet of uh, brass and then you have some strain gauges to measure and this box is uh, to enclose the uh, sheet that's being tested for strain changes um, in an environment that uh, does not change its barometric pressure or humidity or whatever so you, you can uh, discount those influences. An eclipse of the sun took place on October the 24th 1995 in the city of Kunming China. It began at 10.22 Beijing time, reached its maximum at 11.46, and the second contact at 13.18. The maximum of the eclipse was 0.73 when the sun was at an altitude of 60 degrees. On ordinary non-eclipse days, curves are smooth and continuous. So here we have some uh, examples of what you would see on, a, on an ordinary day. So there's no real sort of massive departure. Uh, on this, uh, the strain gauges and uh, on this uh, brass sheet, um, and a various ranges of temperatures. Uh, and he says during the eclipse period of October the 21st to October the 28th, the curves changed suddenly from their original smoothness, with the change occurring right on the points of. 900, 1042, 1500, and 1712 for all five days. Between 1500 and 1700, there's great oscillation with an amplitude that is partly symmetrical to the amplitude on the day of the eclipse. These curves do not manifest any sudden changes or oscillation before October the 23rd or af after October the 28th. So the graph he is referring to is here. And so uh, these, there's the period of the eclipse, uh, uh, and here are the sort of before and after days. So he seems to have replicated some um, sort of azimuthal, some uh, directional changes uh, based on something that's going on because of an eclipse in this sort of gravitational body alignment. Now that's a real physical effect and it's similar to the physical effects that we talked about in the previous paper. In the previous uh, presentation also we talked about the fact that uh, various researchers had established uh, that there were biological changes during uh, solar eclipse and also um, that you could move things around uh, and they would uh, like uh, oysters and they would open uh, at the right time depending on the tide times in a particular part, part of the planet. The same oyster could be moved and it would kind of know when it needed to open for the tide where it's <laughs> going to. Um, anyway, so the next uh, area that he talks about is the effect of eclipse on the casting of lead tin alloy. Another solar eclipse took place on December the 24th, 1992, whose maximum in Harbin City, China was 0.61. Before the beginning of the eclipse, we melted the lead tin alloy, tin 55, lead 45%, into a liquid state and maintained it at the melting point temperature. During the eclipse, we cast a group of samples using the lead tin liquid alloy. Under the same conditions, in the days after the eclipse, we also cast another group of samples. The two groups were photographed by an electron microscope in order to examine their metallographic patterns. The control group shows a random grain distribution. 
the eclipse samples show a sequenced grain distribution. The conductivity of the two groups was also tested and the results indicated that the conductivity of the eclipse sample was 5% higher than that of the control group. So it actually has here the two SEMs and uh, all the links as ever will be in the description of the video so you'll be able to go and look and download these papers and look at them but essentially this is, is a, a sort of typical example from the non-eclipse uh, uh, cast lead tin alloy and this is uh, from a typical sample from one of the cast uh, during the uh, eclipse uh, lead tin alloy and you can see this is just like looks like spots and this has got some uh, regular linear structures within it. So absolutely fascinating. Uh, you've got something that is changing crystal growth during an eclipse when you have the sun, moon and earth aligned. Now this one is really interesting for me. Uh, this is abnormal changes in emission spectra. It is well known that the spectral wavelengths of elements on earth have proven consistent by all tests in the past. They can be altered in the universe only by the gravitational and Doppler effects. For instance, spectral wavelengths of the uh, solar surface compared to those of the Earth's surface show a relative shift of 10 to the minus 6 magnitude. However, during the solar eclipse of September the 23rd, 1987, an eclipse with a maximum of 0.86, we found a relative change of 10 to the minus 4 in the magnitude of the spectral wavelength. So you have two orders of magnitude changing uh, uh, just due to an eclipse uh, where... Um, <laughs> anyway, th this is really fascinating for me. So what they did is they, they used a variety of spectrum analyzers and they photographed emission spectra from hydrogen, deuterium, calcium, carbon nitride, and ni nickel and titanium and a selection of other things and they go into this but you can read it in your own time. Here, the results of our measurements indicate that spectral line spacings that are measured on any unusual day remain unchanged within the average error range while a relative change of 10 to the 4 magnitude took place for all the spectral line distances of hydrogen, deuterium, calcium, carbon nitride, nickel, and titanium, and so on, photographed during the solar eclipse at different laboratories. It can be reliably stated that it is the solar eclipse which causes the relative shift of 10 to the four, minus 4 magnitude in the spectral wavelength. Now, when I read this, uh, this really piqued my interest. I mean, <laughs> of course, the notion of crystal growth changing uh, due to gravitational body alignment uh, is fascinating. And of course, the lead tin alloy changing is really, really fascinating. Sorry, that is the same thing. But uh, of course, the, um, the uh, force changing here is very, very interesting. But for me, uh, this really grabbed my attention. And I'll tell you why. Um, I've got a little note here and it says, could this explain the inability of EDS and XRF to determine elements in Lion, Echo and Hutchison samples? So in Lion and Echo, when we tested under EDS uh, at the university, uh, Masaryk University here in the Czech Republic, uh, there were areas and sample uh, spots and, and areas which it basically could not determine reliably what they were and you kind of had to do a, a rough best guess. In the case of Hutchison, uh, he's regularly talked about uh, the fact that uh, there have been materials produced from his uh, reactors that are not able to be determined what they are or they're, they're incorrect, they seem to be incorrect uh, what they are. And actually, we experienced this on XRF uh, testing in the lab uh, synthesis tech in Sochi. And uh, we'll release that data as soon as it's prepared. But it essentially, uh, uh, it was seeing all kinds of exotic elements, uh, depending on how deep it was through the uh, twisted coral sample. And it's interesting, this, because this hadn't really been discussed, but... Uh, 
uh, it does appear that not being able to determine elements from low energy nuclear reaction sample ash is a big signature of the effect having occurred. And actually, after the Sochi uh, week, I was sitting down at breakfast the day after the main week had occurred. And uh, there was Anatoly Klimov. He was talking to another Russian scientist, and I just invited myself to the table. And uh, the topic got on to the, the difficulty of demonstrating Lena. And one of the principal difficulties he was talking about was that sometimes it's just impossible to determine, uh, using standard technologies, uh, what the actual elements are that are in the physical thing you can see in front of your face when you hold it up to your eyes, <laughs> when you put it under uh, the equipment. And uh, I, I actually talked about this in a video I published on the 18th of January 2018 called Lion Tractor Beam. And, and this was a really important video for me to understand what may be going on uh, with low energy nuclear reactions. So this is the outer crust, uh, which seemed to be determined as Cu2O largely. It's, it's a higher level oxide on the outside. But uh, what was noticed, and uh, hopefully this will be able to show you here, is um, when... When this is under diffuse light, whatever angle you look at it, it just looks silvery gray. Um, but if you get a bright flash that's bouncing the light straight at the sample and back, some planes, some planes will report as uh, uh, this red color. Now, the red color is not surprising because uh, essentially it's Cu2O and crystals of Cu2O in nature uh, are actually very red and so here's the crystals in, in in nature but the interesting thing about these is they're red under diffuse light or and flashlight whatever angle it looks at so this this struck me as something really bizarre anyway i'll leave the link to this uh, presentation from the 18th of january 2017 because this isn't only what i found interesting uh, later in the video i talk about this where with the closest elements that we could determine these large areas were, were ytterbium and hafnium. And these are absolutely not in the starting material. Uh, but it seemed to be that it was to do with some azimuthal change, i.e. depending on the angle. And I actually talk about this as vector fun, like this, you, you've got the beam from the uh, SEM, uh, coming in, exciting these atoms, and a, a uh, X-ray photon is is coming back uh, into the sensor. Uh, but depending, seemingly on the angle, you are getting ytterbium or hafnium or oxygen or copper. But you know there was only copper, and it's an oxide of copper. That's that's all we should expect to see there. And so I was, you know, suggesting by the the name here, tractor beam that. That something is either slowing down or accelerating this light. And for me, the only thing that that could have been is, is something that was, you know, this is light we're talking about. So it kind of had to have been slowing or accelerating uh, using something that could do that which the only thing I could think of was something that acted a bit like a black hole. Um, and this was compounded with something else. And at the time I, I published this video, I asked people to look at the data that was publicly shared that I was putting out because there was more in this uh, that needed a closer look. And what I was referring to at that time, I actually uh, talked about at Sochi. And it was these structures here. And uh, on the surface of the structure, we saw a two point, we saw a three point uh, on the outside surface here in these split planes. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this is ostensibly all essentially at the same angle. But within that same angled sheet, there were also these various elements, supposed elements detected. Uh, here's, a, here's a four point star uh, and here's a, a, a five point star. And by overlaying and doing uh, some additive processes, you could see uh, the, the structure a little bit more clearer than you saw on the straight uh, supposed elemental uh, uh, view uh, in, in, from the SEM. And you see these, what I call the, the yin-yangs, these um, like comet trails 
uh, like pairs. Like you've got a black one and a bright one, a bl one bright one and a black one, a bright one, black one, and so on around this five point with this point in the middle. So I'm saying that this, you know, looked like it was some uh, uh, self-organized structure that was uh, frozen in time at the point that this, uh, and according to the Lion author, it, 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 it froze incredibly quickly. And the data looks like it was freezing from around about what we now know is over a thousand degrees to what appears to have been uh, around about absolute zero. Uh, in, in a few seconds. Um, it, this structure seems to have been frozen in, but it, it, it beggars belief that this could actually be like these elements in these positions. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's some electromagnetic structures that are frozen and locked into place that, that were working on this material whilst it was hot, but got f locked into place. And when the X-ray comes in and excites those atoms and the light comes out, uh, they are influencing, bending the light or accelerating it or slowing it down such that it gets de detected like uh, at a different frequency. And as I, as I said in this, uh, it's saying here that the, the only ways uh, that this can really occur is uh, essentially uh, by gravitational or Doppler effects. Now, I'm pretty damn certain that this sample in the SEM wasn't traveling away or towards the detector bit by bit at large fractions of the speed of light, uh, or certainly high velocities enough to change the uh, frequency of X-rays coming into the de detector. So the only other conclusion I could have is that there is some kind of gravitational effect going on. Wow. Okay, so hopefully you guys can now see why this was important, and actually later on this in this presentation that I gave into so in Sochi, I talked about the work of uh, Adamenko uh, and uh, uh, in um, the Proton Twenty One labs, which he reported, I think, in an interview in two thousand six or two thousand seven. This this slide here, uh, where he actually found these things, which when he fired primary ions in, they disappeared. And uh, if it, when he turned the photomultiplier off, he saw this exponential decay of light and, and then it disappeared. And then the lab technicians found that there was regular arrays of similar structures, but seemingly smaller or, or, or you know, the, the big one in the middle and, and a, an array semi-regularly around this slow, sli slightly irregular outside where the same kind of thing occurred. So this was part of the pattern of data that was telling me that maybe there was some gravitational effect going on. And uh, uh, this paper here is kind of explaining the same sort of thing, that you get emission spectra changing because of gravitational effects. And for some reason, materials that are affected by uh, this alignment of gravitational bodies uh, also show a, an apparent change in spectral lines. So I'm actually going to propose right here and now in this video that the next time there is a solar eclipse that anyone in the vicinity of the area that that passes over during the days at which the alignments uh, or po lunar eclipse or solar eclipse in, in, in and around the days of which uh, the bodies are largely in alignment, that they get a range of samples under an SEM and have it constantly monitoring what the so-called X-ray uh, uh, energy is that's, co that's coming back. Um, something is uh, going on that's allowing these kind of effects to occur, um, uh, which we're seeing here, and I believe that uh, it is something related to something like a gravity-like effect. And so, and, and this is part of the basis for my understanding of that. Uh, now, the other thing, which is very interesting, that we'll go into here, is the research of abnormal effect uh, of eclipse on the rate of atomic clocks. So, um, He's saying, we have analysed atomic clock time comparison from ground wave data of 16 lock chain recorded from 
1987 to 1993 by the U.S. Naval Astronomical Observatory and found an obvious impact of the solar and lunar eclipse on the data. So they've got various eclipse here, and they're showing that, you know, when you have the, the, the alignment here, you get a minimum. When you get the alignment, you've got a maximum. Here we've got a, a maximum. Here we've got an alignment with a, a, a pretty much a, a minimum. Here you've got a maximum, and here you've got a minimum. So... It could be that other celestial bodies like Venus or whatever, there could, there could be some other effects that uh, um, cause uh, more of this uh, to occur. And I would imagine that would be the case. But just focusing on the eclipse data, you can see that there are uh, minimum and maximum there according to their analysis of the data. They then went on to look at uh, other clocks in their own possession. So figure 9 demonstrates the results of a direct comparison between two cesium, this is cesium-137, which is a beta emitter uh, clocks uh, positioned uh, in different azimuths uh, but in the same laboratory. Uh, a direct comparison between two rubidium clocks, which is the isotope that they use, is a beta emitter. Uh, in the same laboratory in the sen uh, city of Changchun is demonstrated in figure 10. Analysis of the graph shows that the relative change of time difference between the two rubidium clocks reaches 3.6 times 10 to the minus 8 magnitude during the solar eclipse. The effect occurs not only on the day of the solar eclipse, but during the period of the three-body alignment approximately. So here's for your cesium-137, uh, uh, cesium I think it's rubidium-87, I can't remember. Um, but here, here you've got an effect during the eclipse and or, or whatever. Uh, I think maybe it's one of these is the eclipse. Um, and then the other ones, I think that's the, actually the eclipse. And then these are other events during the uh, rest of the days. Uh, so here's, here's, your, here's your days, and these are the other days of the three-body alignment. So, uh, of course... Uh, if we actually look here and his discussion, uh, during the period of the three-body alignment, an unusual force of horizontal oscillation takes place. This period has various effects upon the grain arrangement of lead-tin alloy, upon the spectral wavelengths of atoms or molecules, and upon the speed rate of atomic clocks. The uncertain mechanism contained in these effects is not yet explained, all of the abnormal physical phenomena tell us in different ways that there are many secrets yet un uh, undiscovered which occurring during the period of the three-body alignment and which require further explanation. The most important work at present is to repeat our experiments and tests. So, what can we conclude uh, from this? Well, I think you're going to find a lot more supporting data in here. But at the time of this publishing in 1999, Xu Wenzhou did not know what was causing these uh, things, just that it was coincident with three-body alignment. Uh, what uh, Alexander Parkhamov is suggesting here, uh, and is a fact, is that gravity can uh, manipulate what are now understood to be small mass, but do have mass, uh, neutrinos. And he specifically says uh, that the the neutrinos from relic neutrinos can be manipulated. Uh, these are ones that are traveling uh, much, much slower than uh, the neutrinos that come from the sun that are at much, much higher energies. He's also saying in his recent papers that uh, uh, electron interactions at temperature uh, can cause the production of neutrinos. Uh, now, what this could tell you, I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things can come out of this. Now, I want you to think about this. Could it be that, uh, you know, when they're doing these pendulum tests, the effect on the pendulum is different depending on the longitude and latitude on the Earth and gravitational body alignment? You know, you've got crystal changes here. You've got uh, uh, beta decay changes could it be that some people have been unable to replicate, bio replicate biological transmutations? And if you look at the, one of the previous videos I showed you where uh, they did things on the different phases of the moon uh, and they saw some transmutation on certain phases of the moon and not on others. So we have a body of evidence here that shows that low energy nuclear reactions could be very dependent on gravitational effects and also could be affected by position on the Earth. So you could have a, a, a situation where a lab 
operates for 10 or 20 years. And just for some reason, they have no idea, but on certain day, one of their reactors happens to work really, really well. Now, we've already seen that in Alexander Parkhamov's work, uh, 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 the beta uh, emission uh, output uh, or it changes most. It has a maximum uh, during the uh, January, February, March. Uh, and uh, I think it's January, February, I think one, two, three in the year. And then um, it has a minimum in July, August, September. So, you know, if you're going to do Lenar experiments, perhaps you should be attempting them during the first three months of the year. And I am actually kind of reminded of the fact that Alexander Parkhamov does like to do his experiments over the, the turn of the year. Um, it could be that that could explain some more of his success. Uh, what he's now saying is that when, when you have interaction of uh, matter, uh, the electrons, uh, and the body of the bulk material is over 2,000 degrees Kelvin, that the interaction of electrons can form uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos, which are ultra-low uh, uh, energy, and that these have a wave function that spreads over as much as, I think, 5 nanometers or whatever. It's, it's, it's all in his previous paper. Um, and so he's effectively creating these similar neutrinos to the cosmogenic neutrinos, but actually in situ in the reactor. Okay, what I'm suggesting is that it would appear that, uh, um, you know, even crystallographic changes. So, you, you know, if, if condensed matter scientists working with palladium or whatever, and you've got a, a temperature threshold in some plasma or, or surface plasma, both, you know, whatever's created by electrical discharge or, 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 or um, um, heating and cooling cycles, or uh, because that there's uh, some hotter areas because of anharmonic oscillations, the, the recrystallization during periods of different gravitational exposure, uh, uh, which is, according to Alexander Parkhamov, causing fluxes of um, uh, relic neutrinos, could result in some experiments producing higher levels of output. I think we're at the beginning of a complete demystification of Lena. Uh, I would like people to consider uh, that potentially what we saw in this Lion reactor, as I felt I was seeing uh, at the beginning of last year, that there is something going on that is causing these light effects, which looked pretty anomalous to me, and these effects under the SEM. In this case, where this is actually at the same, uh, pretty much the same angle uh, as uh, all of the rest of this, this isn't some incident angle uh, effect, and you're still seeing these supposed uh, transmuted elements. You know, it could be that Lena researchers have done a best guess of what the element is there, but it's it's not that there actually is a change in the element. It's that there is some other exotic vacuum structure that's sitting within that metal, because Shoulders said these structures like to stay in metals indefinitely that's sitting in that metal that is able to bend or accelerate light depending on the, or <laughs> not necessarily just light, but it's affecting something uh, depending on the instant angle. So I really encourage you to go through all this. Uh, and a bit before, before I close out this video, I want to talk about, you know, you know, you could say, these are ridiculous claims, these are ridiculous claims. It is nearly the 30th anniversary of Pons and Fleischmann's announcement. And so I kind of want to bring it back to um, another thing that uh, I was talking about. During the Magneto Toro electrical radiation talk that I translated of Alexander Shishkin, I noticed that he was talking about this work by the Nobel Prize laureate um, Barkler from the 1910s, where he had discovered these over 100 uh, kV emissions, which were more uh, energetic, and he called them J radiation than, than K shell emissions. And around that time, I, I, I discovered when I was making this presentation that 
Martin Fleischmann and other researchers in the early days of Lena have also observed these high energy emission X-rays. And so you can go and look at this new type of penetrating radiation Alexander Shishkin video for that. But I found this discussion in a uh, interview that was published on Infinite Energy. And I said, really, I think people need to go and look at other things that are in this interview that was being said by Martin Fleischmann. Now, I'm going to tell you what I was referring to then. This. So here we are. This is page one of the November 1996 uh, uh, issue of In Infinite Energy. And this is the interview with Professor Martin Fleischmann, con conducted by Christopher P. Tinsley. And this is the section I want you to look at. Are you interested in any other, shall we say, controversial areas of science? Are there any things which most people would perhaps dismiss, but perhaps you have a, a less certain view? And Martin responds. Yes, well, cold fusion is part of a much wider area. And I have been really quite uncertain that our theory and understanding of condensed matter is at all satisfactory. However, I'm not interested in some of the more extreme ideas which have been put forward and which interest you. You know, in the future of energy. So Tinsley says, I will say that some of this gravity modification stuff does, in fact, appear to have a theoretical basis, as well as some experimental evidence, dot, dot, dot. Martin responds, well, if you think about gravitation, until we have a unified field theory, then you can't be sure what's going to happen. Tinsley says, even Frank Close said that we don't know much about gravity and anything might happen. Martin says, we really have an incomplete understanding. This will change, but there are one or two notable exceptions, which I don't want to talk about now. We have no understanding of quantum gravity, and until that happens, we can't be sure that nature won't play some rather strange tricks. As I told you, when we were talking before, we had about four, four, that's four projects which we were working towards. One was to do with gravitation. One was actually to do uh, with the behaviour of electrons in metals. We actually started to collect equipment together to investigate the behaviour of electrons in metals. But, dot, dot, dot. I have told you, and it's like, <laughs> what was going on in here? Because this is Martin talking. <laughs> I've told you, there have been certain themes which have run through my work, although they have never really been disclosed. I have often worked on topics where something short of the final answer would nevertheless be quite interesting. When I think about what I have done, I find that I have failed to achieve any of my longer-term objectives. Tinsley says, a pretty impressive failure, surely? Martin says, I have been content with what I have achieved, but I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve. Tinsley says, which was? Fleischmann, to gain a better understanding of condensed matter. In order to do so, as with cold fusion story, I find the answers to the global questions have eluded me. Tinsley says, most of the truly exciting science over the last half century has been in condensed matter. You are saying? Yes. In terms of its value to humanity, it has been the area of science which has been of the greatest benefit. And then he says, however, there is a lot to be said for working in high vacuum. Curiously enough, I am again extremely interested in the behavior of thermionic diodes. I find I do not understand how a thermionic diode behaves, as I am interested in the interaction of charges in electrolytes, I think about simpler systems, and from that try to understand the behaviour of the thermionic diode. I do not understand it, and I don't think that anybody else understands electrons in a vacuum either. This is absolute dynamite. Please read it. Think over what it's saying over what it's saying again. Talking about electrons' behaviours in metals, about thermionic diodes, read what they are. Look at history of thermionic diodes. Where does that start? Look at the fact that he's saying, I did work on gravitation, 
And there's at least two other areas here. <laughs> there's areas which he did not disclose. What else was he working on? Well, we already know from our experience with uh, John Hutchison that he was able to lift at one point with four kilowatts. He was able to lift 750 kilos, like approximately 1,500 pounds of metal in one go. There are videos of him lifting a cannonball and so forth. We know that he was able to disrupt metals. And we know from uh, this particular video uh, uh, presentation earlier in that we're able to see that there is the ability to affect crystal grain, to actually affect the way the material behaves. Now, if you can imagine something with cy cycling or having waves uh, of, let's say, for, a, for argument's sake, gravitational waves coming through, you'd be going from something that's trying to be this to this, and it would just kind of jiggle around. Okay? Now, it's very interesting to me that over the last couple of months, several patents have been released by the US Navy. Navy. One is piezoelectricity-induced room temperature superconductor. And this is using aluminium uh, with PZT. So uh, the aluminium is the most affected uh, material, it would seem, in uh, John Hutchison's work. And uh, it's interesting that that is the choice here. I think it's an excellent Lena fuel for reasons I've discussed previously. So this is talking about room temperature superconducting. But this is connected to another patent. And that patent is talking about uh, inertial mass reduction device. And here we go. And it goes into it. You can look at it. I'll have these links to these uh, patent applications in the uh, description. The other one is this. And this is about uh, a... Here it is. High frequency gravitational wave generator. Okay. And if we go through this... This phenomenon, known as the Gerstenstein effect, and can be utilized for a variety of applications ranging from advanced field propulsion. So we've got one of these related patents that's talking about uh, gravitational shielding. Um, so this is space drive to communication through solid objects, as well as asteroid planetoid disruption. So like something, say, the size of Pluto. I mean, why stop at Pluto? But anyway, they're saying asteroid or planetoid disruption and disintegration when coupled with high energy electromagnetic field fluctuations. Here we go. We've got something that is able to destroy a reactor if it is the same thing that's going on. Down here is talking about uh, craft mass reduction effects uh, by quantum, a control and coherence of the collective quantum fluctuations in the vacuum uh, and so forth. So these are very interesting patents. And these kind of chime to the superconductivity, the low energy nuclear reactions, the energy production that you would get from having a room temperature, the potential for energy production systems uh, from room temperature uh, uh, superconductor, and uh, you know inertial mass confinement, this is gravity. These are kind of all the sort of concepts that are being discussed, maybe potentially by Martin Fleischmann. And we already know from Alexander Parkamov and others that it would seem that something is being caused by gravitational lensing of something uh, that is able to transmute matter or accelerate decays. And for me, I, I want to drop in one little tidbit at the end of this presentation. I really want you to go away and think about it. When I was with John Hutchison, he said, my technology accelerates time. I want you to think about what that's actually saying. What does accelerating time mean? Don't take it literally, necessarily. Think of the implications. Thank you for your time, and I really hope that you can pitch in and help out with the translation of this book. I think it's going to be a really exciting time this year in Lena history.